Okay, thanks. So, okay, first question is, do you hear me? Yeah, I think it works. Yeah, thank you, um, and good afternoon, and it's nice to be here, and Trevliga Trefas. So uh, I'm from the Finnish Food Safety Authority, and uh, my background is was originally in mathematics, and uh, and then I did PhD on, on Bayesian modeling and, and biostatistics, and, and then since that I have been working for quite many years uh, in the area of food safety applications and uh, so um, I tried to make some kind of compilation of a couple of problems which could somehow give you some kind of flavor of what kind of problems there, there can be and I feel this quite different from, from many many other areas of, of research but, uh, but there is always something in common I, I hope. Uh, so how does it start? Uh, yeah, it's actually this way. Yeah. Okay. So introduction. Uh, the, the the food safety risk. So you have to know something about wha what you eat and and what's in it. And so at, at least uh, I know what what we had 50, 50 minutes ago. But uh, uh, okay. But uh, we study whole populations and the population risks. And uh, of course, then we need to have some some data about the population behavior and what's what's in the food and how it was made and etc. And I have uh, four four different uh, uh, examples, different areas. One is a very simple example of something that could be done in 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 simple uh, small data sets. Uh, and then th I have three different uh, bigger uh, problem areas. One for the evidence synthesis, synthesis and, and then for uh, Bayesian source attribution and Bayesian methods for, for, the, for acute food consumption risks and, and predictions. So uh, the whole area of food safety is actually uh, kind of continuum from the, from the primary production, from the farms to the, to the consumers. And you have lots of steps between, of course, there are processing steps and there are uh, these uh, retail and, and restaurants and, and food making uh, steps. And uh, all of them, of course, have some effect on, on the risks. And so what you need to have some information about each of these steps and, uh, for example, how, how much and how often people eat specific types of foods, how they were kept or made and where they were obtained from and how they were pro produced. And uh, you can have Bayesian methods then to, to quantify the, the probabilities and uncertainties related to each of those steps. Or you can focus on just one, one step in the, in the process. And so I'm, I'm not the only one who is doing Bayesian food safety modeling, so there are a couple of other papers and actually much more than this, but just a, a, a small coll collection of some papers from the recent years. Uh, so there are some people working on, on these kind of Bayesian applications and, and these papers are, well, these are of course made by some people who are very knowledgeable about mod modeling and they can do quite complicated Bayesian models in, in those situations. But uh, uh, what I want to show you to is, is uh, to start with some very simple things that uh, come up in in, in uh, typical application uh, papers if you if you pick out pick out a typical applied science paper uh, in food sci food science uh, then i guess the the most typical statistical methods are still the traditional ones the, the p values and etc and etc and testing and and of course uh, as, as some of the previous uh, speakers mentioned there are always some difficulties with these uh, testings and they can be just too 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 simple for the for the problems and and there's also the questions of what test to use and is the sample size large enough and is the number of blocks or groups large enough and then the interpretation of the results that uh, you get uh, either a rejection or or no rejection of the null hypothesis and then what to say then uh, and then not these multiple testing problems and and then also I think quite often you see in some papers, uh, testing maybe just because of the habit of, the, of testing that you need to do some kind of routine testing, and sometimes you feel that uh, you could do something more informative with, with, with the data. And I just uh, pick out one one example from from a, a 
a recent paper that there was uh, some paper of reporting biofilm production by 10 strains of uh, uh, Salmonella enteritidis on, on cutting boards. And they were testing three different uh, materials for the cutting boards and then trying to see which one of them produces less biofilm, which would, would be the good, good situation. And so we have to think about what are we then asking in, in that kind of question. Is it uh, what material is, is safest? And how does that translate to a statistical question? Is it the question number one, do the materials differ? Or the question two, that which, which material has the highest uh, probability of, of not producing biofilm? And uh, of course, uh, thinking in the Bayesian way, I could uh, formulate this in, in the Bayesian way, that okay, you have a simple multinomial model situation where you have probabilities for each of the four, four uh, outcomes. Uh, and then you can calculate the, the posterior probability of, of uh, each of the different outcomes. And this is very standard situation, as, as you know, if you know Bayesian modeling and, and this uh, uh, simple cases where you can solve the posterior actually. And then you can calculate the uh, all kind of uh, conclusions from this uh, one uh, probability distribution. And you can get it uh, in, in the pictures like, like this, that you have a probability distribution for, for each of the uh, uh, materials to, to not produce biofilm. And then you can do this ranking quite easily by just sampling from those probability distributions, the values, and see that the, what's the probability that the uh, glass is, is, the, is the best material and not, not producing biofilm quite straightforward answer to the to the question and, and here's the the box code you need need to do for doing that okay so this does just a quick small example that uh, for the application of uh, quite simple bayesian things that that could be done with with very very uh, kind of typical small data set comparisons then then you don't have to do the, the the classical testing thing and you could just do things that are just just as, as easy and simple in, in the Bayesian way, and I think you can get a little bit more informative answers and, and make m more interesting comparisons there. Okay, so if I then move to the evidence of this uh, area, I have I start with this uh, school book example that if you have uh, this uh, normal distribution. A school book uh, situation that okay you, you want to estimate the mean and, and standard deviation for for the distribution and this could be for example in the in the uh, risk assessment area it could be there are some reported uh, logarithmic concentrations of, of bacteria or or chemicals in in some samples um, so you have a set of measurements and so it is easy to 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 fit to the data and you get estimate for the parameters but as, as it often is, is the case in risk assessment that, that we happen to get all kinds of data sets and, and usually they are not, not always or hardly ever produced for our uh, risk assessment purposes or, or for the research questions, but they just are collected uh, for completely different purposes by, by possibly different authorities and different uh, uh, investigations uh, uh, reporting the, the data that, that they have to report for, for some other reasons. And then you have to just collect all of those and, and try to do the most most of it. And so you you might get uh, some other data set that is actually not not uh, reporting the individual measurements, but just the uh, averages of let's say ten measurements. And this is still quite simply to to include to this and make a synthesis of these two data sets because it's easy to write that the model you have still the same common parameters and you just. Uh, write a little bit different model for, for the data set too, but you can connect to the same uh, uh, parameters. And uh, then you can we would have um, some uh, third data set, and this one might report uh, only the differences of the measurements. So again, you can still write a, a model which has at least one parameter that is still uh, that the same, and you can uh, take that data set on board uh, also. And then you might have some uh, uh, fourth data set that is uh, reporting the uh, values that are 
that uh, reported values that are below some uh, uh, censoring limit C. So uh, no, some number of data, set, data points that are below some censoring limit C. And of course you can then write a cumulative probability function for that and, and then uh, use that data to, to and, and, and combine all of, all of them. That's quite straightforward. It's, it's really uh, uh, nothing new, but uh, but basically it just makes a full likelihood function if you just combine all, all, all of them. And actually, so, uh, if there's a model with, with common parameters, then there's alwa always a way to, to make uh, information or evidence synthesis. And it's in Bayesian inference, it's basically not, not very far from the uh, likelihood estimation because Bayesian inf inference is using the, the likelihood function. The full likelihood is the same as in the likelihood uh, maximum likelihood uh, estimation. The only difference, of course, is that uh, you don't just maximize the likelihood, but in the Bayesian side you are calculating the posterior distribution of the parameters, which means that you just add, add some prior distributions and do some simulations to, to get the distribution. So, uh, to, to move to a little bit more uh, uh, realistic actual situation, uh, there was one study of uh, Campylobacter risk a uh, couple of years ago we, we did. Uh, it was about Campylobacter in, in broilers. And you can think that these broilers that you, you buy and, and cook, uh, and they are in a way sampled from production batches. And there's variability between the batches and variability within the batches. And in, put it in, to put it in, a, in a one picture, it's like a, you have some uh, data and some, some information about sampled batches. So there are batches, and then there are broilers within the batches, and the variabilities are uh, acting there. And then you could do some Bayesian evidence synthesis from the data you have from that part. And based on that, you might get some kind of uh, informed estimates uh, for making uh, predictions of the actual consumer's risks. And then you need to plug in some uh, predictive model, but you need to have some parameter values to start with and that have to somehow come from, from, the, from the data. But do we have enough evidence for, for an estimate? So actually, this is nice to, to have this example now here because the data was actually from a Swedish uh, data set. And this was done with some, some people from, uh, from Uppsala. And, uh, and we had uh, one, studies, one study of uh, pro Swedish broilers that r represented uh, one broiler from one each production bats. And there were something like uh, 10 batches sampled in a representative way from the, from the whole production system. And we get the result that is the, is the broiler positive or negative. And then if it's positive, we get the concentration value measured. Uh, and the second data set uh, was uh, not about the individual measurements, but it was mean and standard deviation of log concentrations from about 5 to 25 positive broilers per batch, but only from 20 positive batches. And then the number of positives and negatives in each of those batches. Uh, so we can actually get, get a complementing evidence from by combining both data sets. Because in the in the data set A we have information about the mean and the total variance of concentrations in positive broilers in the whole system, but nothing about the within bats prevalence, because there is only one measurement from each bats. So you don't have any idea of, of uh, what's the within bats prevalence. And there's not, not really information about the variance components to, to separate them, that how much of the total variation is due to the variation between batches and how much is due to bit, uh, the variation within the batches of the concentration values. And then uh, if you only have this kind of data, then wh what people typically uh, might do is that, uh, okay, if there's some difficult parameter that you cannot have any, any uh, estimate for it, then they sometimes just uh, assume some value for it. So uh, if the experts say that, okay, the, the prevalence in contaminated batches is very, very high typically, so they might even assume that, okay, it's 100%. And then if you make that assumption, then you can actually ma make a, 
an estimate of batch prevalence, how many percent of the batches are positive, because if you assume that uh, if a batch is contaminated, then, then it's completely contaminated. Then having just one measurement from it, and if it's uh, contaminated, then you know the batch was contaminated. If it's not, uh, then the batch was, was not contaminated. But then you would have to somehow deal with, with that kind of uh, uncertain parameter, that how, how do you approach that? But uh, uh, fortunately, we had this, this second data set that had some information about those within batch parameters, but only for those positive batches. Um, but the uh, drawback in this data set is, of course, that there's no, no information at all about the overall batch prevalence. But by combining those two things, we can uh, still get some, some useful information about the whole production system. And so we make a Bayesian evidence synthesis of that. And the graphical model would look like, like this. And it, the, the idea is still the, the same as in the simple uh, normal model uh, example before, that, uh, that you, you just connect uh, different sub-models that have some, some common parameters. You need to have some common parameters that are somehow part of both, both sides. And then you have some additional parameters that are only in, in one of the sub-models. Model, so that's the overall uh, grand mean of con concentrations in, in positive broilers. That's the mu parameter. And then there's the, the batch-specific uh, uh, mean parameter of uh, concentrations, the mu j. Um, and then there are the two sigma parameters are the between batch uh, variability and within batch variability of the concentration values. Uh, and then the, the Q parameter represents the, the uh, batch prevalence, the p uh, uh, percentage of positive, truly positive batches. And the PJ parameter represents the uh, within batch uh, prevalence of uh, contaminated broilers within the production batch. And, and the boxes represent these known things, the, the data, data values, the things that we, we know, and then these uh, 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 circles uh, represent the unknown parameters. And so you make a full Bayesian model of, of those things and uh, get some, some useful estimates of the parameters controlling the, the whole production system. And here are some images that for the for the variance components that the, uh, the left hand side is the, the, the data set A in which you couldn't uh, get uh, individual estimates of the variance components, but you only know that the, the total variance has to be uh, something that matches the, the variability in the in the data. So so what kind of uh, uh, conclusions you can have from from the two variance components? It would be like okay. One has to be large, or the, or the other has to be small, or vice versa, and you and you only have information about the what what's their their uh, sum. And and then in, in the right hand image, you you had the the data set B, from which you had the uh, information about about the uh, variance components, and then you can make the the synthesis, and you get the picture in the in the middle, and it's still mostly influenced by by the data set B because these parameters, these two variance components are uh, mostly mostly informed by, by the data set B. But uh, of course, they were not the only parameters in the problem because you had uh, a couple of other parameters in the, in the complete problem. So basically, uh, what's the fun of it? So uh, estimation from a synthesis of two, two data sets is interesting for the, for the sake of uh, estimation itself. But there's uh, more than that. We can actually make some useful uh, further further use of that that uh, result, and one uh, in interesting question is uh, related to these microbiological criterions, which can be placed for the for the uh, system, and these are somehow controlling the acceptance of of these batches that uh, that uh, uh, you want to somehow make a, a control system that uh, makes some testing for the batches and will accept only the good quality batches and then somehow re reject the bad quality batches. Uh, and this would be have some kind of effect on the, on the overall risk of the consumers. So we assume that, okay, this is some kind of sampling uh, that is done bat batch by batch. Uh, and if you redu uh, uh, reject the, the bad uh, 
or the contaminated batches, then the consumer's risk is supposedly reduced. But uh, at the same time, you are actually increasing the producer's costs because if you uh, if you make a too strict criterion, then you start uh, rejecting uh, quite many batches and it becomes quite costly for the production. So it's a problem of uh, two two opposite risks: uh, consumers' risks and and producers' risks, and you ha have to find some kind of balance. And uh, and you can uh, investigate at what kind of uh, criterions uh, you should choose to, to somehow satisfy bo both goals. And we can again t t take some uh, Bayesian uh, approach to this, this problem. That okay, we can ask that what does the outcome from such, such test sample uh, represent to us? Okay, it's uh, additional evidence. And again, we can use the Bayesian machinery to update uh, our, uh, our uh, estimates. We can revise the estimates concerning the predicted accepted batches. So we can calculate that, that okay, if we have all the background data that, that we had uh, uh, so far to, to get the uh, evidence synthesis and the estimation of the, of the system parameters, but you using and taking that uh, uncertainty in the assessment and then uh, adding this uh, added uh, information about those uh, accepted batches, we can make a prediction of about what is the likely outcome now in, in, the, in such, ki such kind of uh, batches. And so this would determine that the new consumers' risks um, under such criterion. And uh, at the same time, you can also calculate the probability of rejection of batches uh, and make an uh, uh, evaluation of the predicted percentage of, of los lost batches. And what, what kind of criteria these are? They are this one, one kind of uh, uh, definition of a criterion that, that uh, it's called this NCM criterion, which says that uh, at, at most C samples out of N are allowed to have a concentration value larger than, than M. So the question is how to choose N, C, and M. Uh, three, three things to, to choose, and uh, depending on how you choose them, you make a, a strict criterion or, or, a, or a loose criterion and it, it has some effects on, on the risks and the costs. And you have to take into account the uncertainty in all of this and actually, but I'm not going to into in much details, but this actually involves some kind of uh, what is called sometimes 2, 2D Monte Carlo because it's uh, making a Monte Carlo simulation within the MCMC uh, simulations. and. Uh, simulating the, the variability distributions or integrating over the variability distributions and then uh, producing the what's left uh, as, a, as the uncertainty distribution uh, due to the uncertainty of the of the system parameters but okay without much more details i could show you the the, the image that we could get in the, in the end that you can um, make this kind of graphical assessment of the effect on, on the risk uh, you can evaluate the risk ratio, which tells you that the ratio of the risk uh, for the consumer uh, when this uh, microbiological criterion is, is met. So assuming that only those batches that, that meet the criterion, that are these accepted batches, uh, only those are consumed. What is the risk in, in, in the broilers from those kind of batches? And then compared to the risk if, if no such criterion is applied at all. So that's kind of a default situation that you would have without any kind of uh, uh, that any kind of uh, criterion in, in place. And so you can calculate the risk ratio on, on the y-axis and uh, if the uh, risk ratio becomes one, so it means that you ha have no reduction of the risk because uh, well, the, the risk on, on both sides of the, of the, of the dash is, is the same. And if you get a risk ratio closer down to zero, then you have a lot of reduction in, in the risk. Uh, but at, at the same time, you can also see that the, how does your criterion influence the, the probability of rejecting the batches, how many percent of the batches are likely to be rejected on, on the, uh, the x-axis. And the different colors mean that there are the uncertain distributions uh, resulting from uh, one choice of criterion. So 
So they are corresponding to one choice of uh, the n, c, and m values. And now you can compare that if you if you make a different choices for for the n, c, and m values, uh, then you get a, you get a different uncertainty distribution uh, in in the picture. And now you can make some judgments that okay, if you want to have a risk reduction of more than fifty percent, then you probably need to take a criterion that uh, that is actually producing the 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 black uh, distribution or, or the red distribution there. Uh, but then, if you at the same time are are not willing to accept uh, uh, that that uh, ten percent of the batches would be rejected, uh, then then probably not uh, the red, red one. Uh, the red distribu distribution is not good, so maybe you should then choose a criterion that leads to the uncertainty distribution represented by the by the uh, black points. And you can do this for for all combinations of of criterion and, and see and uh, that how you would like want to choose the criterion to to actually come with come up with the optimal optimal uh, result. And, and taking into account the uncertainty that it's, it's, it doesn't give you the certainty that you will get precisely 50% reduction, but it, there's some kind of uncertainty around it. Okay, uh, so the third area is, is a completely a different, a different application situation, but this also quite active area has been in, in the recent years the, the source, source attribution problems that. Uh, that uh, risk managers would like to know that uh, um, that uh, how many uh, human infections or human cases of illness are actually resulting from from different sources of exposure, which could be the different food, food production systems or different food types or or uh, things like that. Because if you if you then would be able to say that okay, most of the cases are due to uh, source. C, then you would uh, you would be able to to impose some some actions on 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 that uh, exposure to to reduce it, uh, and then you would have you would have some kind of way of uh, allocating your resources more efficiently on on those sources of exposure that are somehow contributing most of the disease cases. So in 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 the microbiological food safety risks, you could have a uh, bacteria types, and uh, you uh, sampled uh, from a few broad food categories denoted as the, as the sources, and this could be, ec uh, for example, uh, let's say broilers uh, as a food group, which could be samples from the meat and or the production animals, and likewise for uh, uh, food coming from turkey meat or or cattle meat or pig meat. And possibly also even other exposures, something like uh, swimming waters or environmental sources. In you might you could have uh, this uh, <coughs> microbiological isolates from each of those exposure groups, and then you would like to have an estimate that okay, which one of them could be explaining most of the human cases. And the human human uh, human isolates are then taken as, as a mixture sample of of those those sources. Uh, and the and then the pro problem is a uh, basically some uh, classification problem that you need to somehow classify the human isolated isolates into those sources and estimate what fraction of cases are generally from which source uh, so that means what those mixture proportions could be so if you have only two sources then you could have a situation like this that there are uh, some proportion q1 of uh, of different bacteria types in in source one, and uh, the same parameters for for the source two, and then you have uh, sam sample X of, of of some observed bacteria types from from the source population one, and the same kind of sample from the uh, source population two, and then you know the bacteria types of of human cases, which you then assume is a mixture. Of Mixture distribution of the types available available from both sources, and the mi mixing prob uh, probabilities are p1 and p2, which then of course have to sum sum up to one. And with several sources, you just have more more and more groups, but the, the basic uh, kind of setting would be this. <coughs> 
And then, uh, again, Bayes uh, can be helpful in, in this kind of classification problems. And there's lots of liter literature on Bayesian classifiers, and I just, just mentioned briefly the Nave uh, Bayesian classifier uh, with uh, these defined sources from 1 to capital I and, and some number of types J. Uh, and you want to calculate the probability of the source I, given that you have seen type J in the human cases. And again, you apply the Bayesian uh, Bayes uh, theorem uh, to calculate the posterior distribution uh, or the posterior probability of source i given that you had uh, uh, type j. And uh, in the simple situation you could have just uh, equal probabilities for, for each sources to begin with. Uh, so if you, have, if you have five sources you just have one over five probability for each of them. And then for the type distribution, then the natural choice would be multinomial distribution. And there you have the multinomial parameters, the, the type frequencies in each of the sources. And this could be, in the simple case, the estimated type frequencies, uh, possibly directly uh, from, the, from the data counts, or the smoothed estimates where you add some, some small prior probability, uh, 1 over j. Uh, which means that uh, if there are some bacteria types that were not seen in the sample from this source, uh, you still consider that thi these are these are possible ones to exist in in this source, because otherwise the the model would believe that they are impossible ones to 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 exist if if, uh, if you haven't seen in, in in the sample. Uh, and then if you uh, place a probability parameter for the for the probability f uh, for the source i and, and place a prior distribution for the parameter, then uh, actually you can ob uh, obtain a posterior distribution for the, for the mixture probabilities uh, p and also the, the individual labels of the, of the human isolates telling you that, uh, that uh, what was the probable source uh, for each, each of, each of your, your human case. And you get a joint probability distribution of, of those conditional on your on your data, which is the, the sample data from the sources, and then the uh, observed sample uh, uh, of the types in human cases. And you can do the uh, very similar thing by also by using a posterior predictive classif classifier, uh, which, which is based on just uh, solving the uh, predictive probabilities for uh, for a new type in a in a source. And there you just uh, integrate over the the uncertainty of the of the type frequencies in in the sources, and you can do the basically the same same idea, but but just uh, using uh, those predictive uh, probabilities for for the types, given that you have uh, have observed some uh, uh, sample of types from from the sources, and there are even more complicated things, and you could uh, spend the whole whole week. Uh, uh, talking about this Bayesian uh, clustering and, and classifying methods. There are uh, research on, ongoing, in, in particular in, in, in the genetic uh, sciences, uh, using Bayesian models for genetic uh, population structures, classification and clustering, evolutionary trees, etc., etc. Uh, but uh, this, my example here is just a very simplified uh, classifica classification example where you just have some uh, simply defined groups and some uh, small data sets of the types from from those and and the source attribution models are also there are several of them have been published in the literature and and uh, and uh, applied in various data sets and and one thing that is somehow a little bit bothering me sometimes is that uh, w when you get a result then you get some kind of uh, estimate for the for the population attribution fractions but how how do you know that is this a if this is a correct result, because of course you cannot compare your uh, result with the true population fractions, because that's something you can never uh, observe exactly. But you can maybe do some simulation experiments, and there are just uh, two different cases that you can make some simulation trials. That uh, if you assume that these there are several types are are frequent in in many sources, or if you only have uh, very few types that are somehow dominating the sources, and 
and you can simulate that kind of simulated data sets and do the cl uh, classification and see how, how correctly you get the result. And if you uh, generate your data sets many, many times uh, artificially, so you know the correct parameter value then, and then you can d do the classify classification, and then you can see in, in the end that, uh, how often you were you were correct. And so in the, in the x-axis you have the true po population attribution that was uh, behind your simulated data, and then you have the estimated population fractions. And uh, and in this case you get the uh, in the left hand side you had uh, more data and you are, you get m more correct results, but in, in the right hand side picture you have less data and uh, you start getting a little bit um, uh, less correct uh, results. And what's interesting is that it actually the, the results are uh, gradually tilting towards the, the solution of 0 0.2, which is basically the, the prior probability that you had in the be beginning. That uh, if you don't have any data, then uh, your prior was that uh, each source was equally uh, possible. And if you have five sources, then your prior probability is one over five. And so you, uh, when your data is getting uh, smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, then what, what you get in the end is your uh, prior probabilities. And in the other case, if you had uh, only a few types that are dominating the sources, then I the, the whole problem becomes simpler because you can identify much more clearly that which, which one was the case. Okay, so I have not very many minutes left, so I just uh, briefly uh, mentioned a couple of things about the last uh, uh, issue that was uh, related to the intake assessment. It's basically the, the whole uh, intake assessment uh, literature is about estimating the exposure either uh, microbiological or, or chemical, and then you have this, uh, uh, you are trying to estimate the, the exposure, which is the product of the concentration of the hazardous substance in that uh, you know, f food type, and then the uh, consumption amount, let's say in grams of that food type per serving. Uh, and these are basically, you can assume them to be independent, that uh, the, the concentration values are what, what they are, and you just cannot see uh, how, how much there is, there is uh, some chemical substance in, in, in an apple that you, you eat. Um, and then uh, you need to have basically some, some uh, data about the occurrence data of the chemicals or, or, or microbes and the consumption data. Uh, and then there's some variability uh, be between the samples and between the food types and variability between days and variability between individuals in, in the consumptions. Okay, so this is the gravart lux. Uh, so you, you could have a listeria uh, in that kind of uh, uh, raw uh, fish products. And so this depends on the probability, of course, to, to, to basically to consume that kind of food. Not, not all people even, even like to eat it, but some people uh, eat a lot of them. And then you have uh, some probability of listeria in it, so you have to uh, uh, estimate the prevalence and probability distribution of the consumption amounts and, and the concentrations and the dose response probability, and also take into account the possible growth of bacteria. And then uh, if you model the, the consumption process, then uh, it happens that people buy a certain amount of fish at home and then they eat uh, the first day and the second day and maybe the third day and maybe the whole week and keep it in the fridge and maybe not in, in a cool enough fridge. So you have, would like to have some, somehow quantify that too. And again, I make some, this kind of pa the same basic idea of making evidence synthesis from, from those data sources. And I have a, a set of parameters for, for the whole problem. And uh, sorry for the picture, there, there's some uh, technical error with, with the, with the st long stra uh, lines there. It should be a simple uh, box plot, but uh, it should represent uh, the probability of, of illness if you actually do eat uh, that kind of food that was bought uh, and it was contaminated on day one, and if you actually really do eat on, on the day, day number five or, or after one week. Uh, and assuming you, you kept it in, in the fridge in, in some temperature of uh, seven degrees or something like that. And so you can see that the, there are actually the, the two, two different colors represent two different uh, uh, population groups, age groups, and uh, but of course only if you eat it. And then you have to somehow take into account the uh, 
prob daily probability to continue consumption and from the consumption data we could estimate that because that was uh, reporting the the consumption for, for two consecutive days and from that we could estimate transition probabilities that uh, if you consume that kind of fish the, the, the first day was the probability that you actually uh, also consume it uh, on the second day and then you can c calculate some probabilities that, that what happens uh, ov over a week that uh, what's the probability that you will actually continue consuming it consecutively for the whole week and uh, what, what happens then to your risk and what's the cumulative uh, cumulating effect uh, uh, for the probability to actually get ill uh, at some point during the week and it depends the whole thing actually depends on two uh, competing effects that uh, there's the bacteria growth and and then the, your chances of actually quitting eating the, the contaminated fish and uh, if you actually tend to uh, keep eating it uh, for 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 many days then it actually might happen that the bacteria growth is, is actually winning the game and then you get ill but if the if you if you keep it in in a cool enough fridge then the bacteria growth is not fast enough and then, then you might be uh, be safe to to continue eating the uh, couple of more days and it's kind of a kind of battle of those or balancing balancing between those two two forces and and you can actually get some information for for those kind of things from your data and make the make the synthesis and uh, and uh, one thing that was uh, also related to this this uh, data set was was the estimation of the uh, bacteria concentration levels uh, which were in li for listeria they were quite low levels in in the beginning and and so we have this sensor data problem and i have just this one uh, kind of uh, uh, manual video of, of how your estimates develop that if you have a uh, 50 data points and none of them are are below the, the censoring limit so you have 50 uh, accurate measurements of concentration values and then you get the distribution uh, of your of your parameter values but if you have a censoring limit higher and higher and higher then you have less data, uh, accurate data points and what happens if all of your data uh, points uh, are below the censoring limit and then you can actually visualize uh, your, your uh, uncertainties about these, these parameters and this could be the representing the posterior distribution or actually equivalently the, the likelihood function in the case if you have uh, uh, uniform priors. So, it, so that is just an example of, uh, of how Bayesian uh, estimation and, and likelihood estimation can be in this example uh, uh, basically equivalent except that you get a distribution uh, for the Bayesian side. Okay. So, uh, to, to conclude, uh, Bayesian methods have been already long used in many applications of food safety risks, uh, but not always, in, uh, always known or called as Bayesian, and I've seen papers that actually do uh, simulations that are actually are equivalent to, to calculating a posterior distribution, but they don't necessarily describe it as a Bayesian uh, estimation. But in, in fact, when you see how it's done, it's actually, that's what it is. And I think there's still m uh, more potential in the Bayesian methods and maybe we just need to increase some uh, uh, Bayesian training and here are just some uh, references if you're interested they are uh, dealing with, with, with those examples I, I showed to you and, and so in the end, thank you.